Okay. There we go. Tony, whenever you're ready. All right. You're listening to MLBC, the Madonna podcast, your place for all things Madonna, Louise, Veronica, Ciccone. Hey, guys, it's Tony. And hey, everybody, it's Stefan. Welcome to another episode of MLVC. Today on the show, we are so thrilled to be joined by film director, producer, and writer, Susan Seidelman. Susan, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Very oh. exciting. Oh, that's just awesome. I'm so excited to finally meet you and talk to you. Uh, my 13-year-old self would be <laughs> screaming right now. <laughs> so, Susan, I, I have to applaud you because... For the very first time, you are the first guest we've ever had on the show that comes from the same hometown that I do. Where? Huntington Valley. I grew up in Abington Township oh, in Fox, my... Fox Chase Manor. I was I was reading your book and it was like throwing me back to my childhood because I was like, oh. I've been there. I've been there. I know this. I know oh, that. Like, wow. I, I meet very few people from Huntington Valley. So yeah. that is, that's blowing my mind. Right when, when you mentioned yeah. Del Ennis Bowling Alley, I was on the Saturday morning bowling league at Del Ennis and that's how I learned to bowl. And I, I'd have to walk up the street to get there. And Oh, wow. That's, a, that's, a, well, that's a whole other conversation. But <laughs> yeah. that, um, that Huntington Valley shopping center was sort of a walk from my house and where I would go after school just about every day. Wow. Um, you know, 11 to 14 or something. Yeah. But yeah. I, yeah. I mean, they, I used to go to the little bookstore that was there. Yeah. My first job was at the supermarket that was in the shopping center. I mean, that, oh, I, 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 yeah, it's, yeah, it's fun. So, so do you remember when there was a Woolworths there? There used no, to be I think that was before that was before me. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, well, that Fox Chase, Huntington Valley, I mean, I literally lived a 10 minute walk from that shopping center and yeah. I write about it in my book. Mm -hmm. Yes, oh. yes, <laughs> yes, which which we will definitely get to in a second. Tony, do you want to give our listeners a proper introduction to Susan Seidelman, even though they don't need it? Uh, absolutely. It's my pleasure. So Susan Seidelman is an American film director, producer, writer who broke into the film scene in 1982 with her first film, Smithereens, which became the first low budget independent American film to compete for the Palme d'Or Prize at Cannes Film Festival. For all listeners of the show, though, you know her second film, Desperately Seeking Susan, which starred Roseanne Arquette and Madonna, among others the person for whom this show is dedicated to, obviously. She's worked with a myriad of A-list Hollywood talent in film and television, such as Meryl Streep, Daryl Hannah, Roseanne, Peter Falk, Diane Weist, Brenda Vaccaro, Emily Lloyd, Mira Sorvino, Juliette Lewis, Laverne Cox, and notably Sarah Jessica Parker, when Susan notably launched the Sex in the City franchise by directing the first four episodes of the very first season of that show. And now she's releasing her very first book, a memoir called Desperately Seeking Something, a memoir about movies, mothers, and material girls through St. Martin's Press. And that's going to be available June 18th. Welcome, Susan, again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my mind is still blown because a lot of what I talk about in the beginning of my book is sort of who I was back then and how that affected the movies I mm -hmm. made. And I am just so surprised to meet somebody else from literally, it's a mm -hmm. little suburb outside of Philadelphia, kind of in what was once farmland that then in the 60s, early 60s, mm -hmm. when I was there, became a suburban development. Yeah. Um, so that is amazing. Yeah. I, I, Susan, I was able to, uh, I was, my family still lives in Pennsylvania. I'm in Philadelphia again now. And after many years in New York and I had been visiting my family and I had to go back to that neck of the woods yeah. for some reason, I forget what it was. And I thought, oh, let me drive by my old house. And the woman who lived there was coming out and she saw me trying to take a picture of the house and she yeah. invited me in. So I, I was like literally walking back into time where I was yeah. like, this is very strange. I shouldn't be here. You know, it was, yeah. it was fascinating, yeah. but um, yeah. So we'll, we'll kick off your, your new memoir is a fantastic look at your life from the early days in the Philadelphia suburbs to becoming a trailblazing film director of major studio motion pictures. What inspired you to tell your story about your life back then and then all throughout your career? Yeah, 
Um, well, there were a couple of things that coincided. One was the pandemic, which obviously was a big shock for everyone. Um, but I, I had lived in New York for about 40 three years. And in um, late, I think it was 2017, I left New York and moved out to Bucks County area outside of Philadelphia. And, and I was adjusting from city life, you know, kind of, you know, feeling out what it was like to be a country girl. Um, and then shortly thereafter, the pandemic hit. So I was going through that transition, city country, and then it was, I'm in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> and I'm in uh, lockdown for, you know, two years. And I think also one of the things that triggered was that in the very beginning of the pandemic, I think it was about six weeks in, I heard about the death of Mark Blum. Oh, Yeah the actor from uh, Desperately Seeking Susan. And suddenly when things like that happen, including just the whole craziness and insecurity of life at that time for everyone, it does make you kind of look inside and, and reflect and say, how did I get from there to here? And I think to be quite honest, the other thing that happened is I was soon to turn 70. You know, when I say that number in my head, I go, you know, 70, it's a scary number because, you know, when you're 50s and 60s, you're kind of middle-aged, 60s, you're older middle-aged, but you still are in that middle-aged category, mm -hmm. sort of. 70 is the, the number itself is, is scary, especially because I didn't feel it, but I was- Or look it, or look yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but, but I was feeling just, I was aware of my mortality, you know? I mean, yeah. I think a lot of people were during the pandemic because life was just, you know, so kind of surprising and uncertain. And I think all those things together made me start to reflect. And I, I didn't start out wanting to, I didn't know if this would be a book or what it would be. I just found myself remembering things and taking notes on my iPhone, just on that note app on my iPhone. And pretty mm -hmm. soon I had, you know, 500 notes and wow. I started to think, you know, maybe I can put them in order and see if there's a story there. And th basically that's what I did. Mm -hmm. So without giving away too much, Susan, um, when you started to revisit all these different um, stages of your life, I guess stages is a good word. Uh, what was the part, which parts stood out to you that you were like, oh, I love revisiting this part of my life, it, you know? I think what stood out to me the most was how it all connected. Mm -hmm. Like when I thought back and when I was thinking about growing up, I mean, I was born in Philadelphia proper and then you know, in the early 60s, when everyone was moving to the suburbs, my father, you know, moved us all to this, you know, what he thought of as his, his, his dream life, you know, a suburban house with a circular drive, a cul-de-sac, you know, uh, you know, it was his version of, um, you know, the post-war dream. <laughs> my blue heaven. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, um, but somehow when I started thinking back that I knew that I wanted that there was some part of me that felt different than the world I was living in that was sort of looking to cross over into some other world mm -hmm. and it was there as a kid you know when I first watched Breakfast at Tiffany's on TV at the age of or not on TV I guess maybe I saw it at the movie theater or whatever you know a young teenager I was always sort of looking to cross over that bridge that would take me from where I was living into the city. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking about so many of the films I made, which are all about somebody who wants to be somebody else or reinvent themselves mm -hmm. or be a better version of who they are, a more... Um, just a more fulfilled version of who they are. Mm -hmm. And um, so I saw all these, you know, connect the dot things going on. Mm -hmm. 
that is what surprised me the most when I started putting all those pieces together. Yeah, I, one thing I, I was talking to Stefan about is that um, there were also, you recount in the book, you know, there were uh, there was a woman you went to school with and also you mentioned Nancy Spungen who kind of came from the area and must have had the same idea to get out and to strike out on their own and make a name for themselves. But you're the one that made it, you know, and that's that's because you had a you had a more specific picture of what you wanted to do, right? Yeah, I mean, I was rebellious, but I also... I came from, I mean, I, my, my family, even though I fought with them, my parents a lot when I was growing up and I was like the, the problem child in the family, <laughs> but, but I, but my problems were fixable with age or I mm -hmm. was able to fix them once I figured out, you know, a creative outlet for it, a, as opposed to my friend Gail who mm -hmm. died and Nancy Spungen who came from Huntington Valley and uh you know had a a a sad ending yeah um i think film school i think moving to new york and being able to focus all those creative impulses in an environment where other people were creative and were inspiring or the the, the place and the time you know moving yeah. to new york city in 1973 74 it was like a a very vibrant dilapidated <laughs> place to 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 suddenly find yourself yeah i was i was loving you were such a vibrant character if i can use that word in your book like because i don't know you as a person i was like oh my gosh i'm like this this is such a lovely story and how you crafted it and weaved it i mean it's basically your life but um yeah i was very entertained reading about it and i think also just having discovered when I started reading it that you were from my hometown I was like oh and Susan the parallel doesn't end there just so you know so I also <laughs> I also then moved to New York to go to film school and oh, really? oh, wow. I went I went to school in Long Island and went to film school the, the comparison ends about there because I didn't then end up graduating and making mo major motion pictures with Madonna but um there's still time, right? I've still got time. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So we're soulmates. That's very <laughs> interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. And now we're back. Now we're both back in PA. I mean, I think you're near New, New Hope, and I was like, uh, my friend got married near New Hope just the, just last yeah. year. I was like, what a small yeah. world. I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm I'm right outside of New Hope. I'm ten minutes away. I'm in uh, on the Jersey side. If you know Stockton, New Jersey, it's mm -hmm. right across that bridge. Yeah, yeah, I forget. There's a little town. My friend got married right across the bridge from New Hope. I forget what the little town is called, but she, her and her wife got married there. I officiated. I was like, oh, this is a yeah. cute little town. Very artsy. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? Is it, is it, it's, um, I like telling stories. I mean, maybe that's why I'm a, a, a filmmaker, mm -hmm. is to get to tell stories. And since I was stuck at home and, and, and in all fairness, I... At, at the age I'm at now, I I suddenly felt like I could tell those stories. Yeah. Like I had lived enough. You know, I'm always shocked by people who are writing their memoir at age 32. And I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, I mean, <laughs> that's interesting. But I, 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 for me, I needed some distance from sure. myself yeah. to, to be able to talk about myself. Um, but you know, I, I like to entertain, but I also wanted to entertain and be honest and most importantly, be honest to myself. You know, there's, there's, um, I mean, I was, I tried to be honest about the things that I did right, the things that I did wrong, the, the you know, of which there were many ups and downs and, and reinventions and, you know, what it could have should is. Sure. Um, and I wanted to include all that also because um, at the time when I was starting out, I was in film school in the mid seventies, there really weren't too many role models that, you know, women that I knew who were directing movies. And yeah. I wanted to kind of say to other people out there, to future generations and to young people, young men and women, you know, there's all different ways that film directors can look and be and act and uh, we're all good. They're all good. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, so I, I'm curious. So now that you've written your book, 
I know that biopics are all the rage these days. Uh, even fellow colleague Madonna is, yeah, yeah. You know, is known to be working on her very own biopic. And I've wondered, now that you've written a book about your life, might we see a Susan Seidelman biopic coming down the, ca uh, coming down the, the road? Well, I don't think I'm going to direct it. If somebody else wanted to do it, they're, they're welcome to. And I have, um, you know, the flattering, this is the very flattering version of the spirit of the person that uh, I would <laughs> like to play me. I was trying to you know, um, in, in the email, I had gotten that question. And so I was thinking, who who would I like? And, <laughs> I, you know, part of me feels weird even mentioning this name, but there's something about her spirit that I like. Somebody who was a little rebellious, but also playful and mm -hmm. not like happy rebellious in the end. And that's Billie Eilish. Yeah. Oh, Yes. I could see so, that. I kind of like her vibe. Mm -hmm. um, oh, she's a little off, but not, but, but kind of, um, yeah, like a spirited, playful version of off, mm -hmm. as opposed to an angsty, right, scary version of off. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um. So, Susan, um, I want to talk about the. Uh, the female filmmaker era of the 80s. I know that in the 70s, you must have been inspired by, um, you know, the European female filmmakers that were making a name for themselves. I'm thinking of Lena Wertmuller and, 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 you know, others of that. But in the United States, that still was not, I guess, for lack of a better word, normalized. Then in the early 80s, Amy Heckerling hit pay dirt with Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And then suddenly every studio wanted their own female director to, you know, kind of do the same thing. And, you know, for example, Martha Coolidge, um, yourself, uh, Lisa Gottlieb, there are a lot of them, uh, Joan Micklin Silver. Um, I know that, I know reading in your book that you had a similar experience to Martha Coolidge and Amy Heckerling, where you were offered, you know, vapid teen films and, um, yeah. you know, commercial films. I know um, you were up for the Joy of Sex film that Martha Coolidge ended up having to suffer through. Yeah. That was interesting to read about because that's a story that I uh, that I followed for a while. So yeah. was there, what, can you tell us what your experience was like for you finished Smithereens and then were, was your phone ringing off the hook or did you have to go out and take meetings, um, you know, with these execs in Hollywood? It must have been very daunting. Yeah, well, my phone was, I, I was, I got an agent after Smithereens mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the, the usual process is they bring you out to L.A. for the meet and greet. I also called it the dog and pony, pony show. show. Yeah. <laughs> taken to each of the studios to meet executives um, because I'm still an indie filmmaker. I wasn't meeting with the top. I say guys because they were all guys at that mm -hmm. point. You know, I was sort of meeting with the mid-level executives or the, you know, the, the, the D girls, the development yeah. girls, yeah. as they were called at that time. Um, but, you know, a lot of enthusiasm and then not a lot of, you know, a lot of bad scripts. And, mm -hmm. and they were all kind of scripts about, you know, babysitters and and being stalked by psycho killers or <laughs> bitchy prom queens. Yeah. <laughs> or, well, there's nothing wrong with a good bitchy prom queen story, but the ones I was reading were not that good. Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't see myself as a kind of mainstream teen, girl teen movie director. I mean, I my interests were more aligned with European cinema. I mean, yeah. I think Mothering sort of falls into that category, accessible, but but in that that category. Um, so it took me a long time to find the right script. I mean, after Smithereens came out, it, it was probably a good year and a half of reading scripts before I found the one I wanted to do because I knew I had heard horror stories about some, I won't name them, but there's one person in particular I was thinking of who did a wonderful independent movie about two women who had friendship and, um, 
you know, she got to do another Hollywood movie and she had a very heavy handed, you know, uh, male producer looking over her shoulder and yeah. and it was not and this wasn't Martha Coolidge. This is a different yeah. story. It was a you know an unsatisfying experience and then she kind of disappeared for many, many years. She reemerged doing TV mm -hmm. stuff. But I wanted to make movies and mm -hmm. I knew that not only did I have to pick the right material, I had to pick the right team. And um and then I mean one of the things I talk about in the book is that I happen to be very superstitious. And um, so the fact that I received this script and it had my name and desperately seeking Susan, I kind of took that personally. I, um, you know, I kind of knew it was the right project and it was the right team. And, um, you know, it had two female producers, Midge Sanford, Sarah Pillsbury. It had a, 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 a woman writer, Leora Barish. And it was a woman studio executive named Barbara Boyle. Oh. Who had, she was like a, a senior vice president of production at Orion in LA at the time. And she was a feminist. She was like a hardcore 70s, Gloria Steinem, you know, kick-ass feminist. And she was so excited. She really championed the film. Mm -hmm. And Orion agreed to allow her to green light it, Mike Medavoy, thankfully, um, if it could be made for a relatively low budget, which was under $5 million. Wow. So the good thing was that, you know, we had this great team um, and the other good thing was because it was a relatively low budget, I didn't feel the pressure of the studio mm -hmm. looking over my shoulders. They mm -hmm. kind of said, we approved the budget. Um, we, they had approved Rosanna Arquette, who was the first person attached to the, the film. And, uh, you know, it could be done on location in New York. And for me, I had done smithereens in the East village and this mm -hmm. was, shot in significant part in the East Village. And so I wasn't scared. Like I knew the material mm -hmm. and I related to both the characters. I mean, I related to the Madonna character because I was this East Village girl living this funky life at the time. And I related to the Rosanna Arquette character, the housewife Roberta, because she was living across the bridge from New York and I had grown up across metaphorically across that same bridge mm -hmm. wondering can I get to the other side what's going on there what am I missing yeah so before we deep dive into the making of Desperately Seeking Susan tell us about the early 80s downtown art scene which included yourself and many other artists who are now you know legends yeah. um the world that you described and showed us in both of your first films. I mean, and yeah, both of your films. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the, they're kind of different because Smithereens is a grittier version of yeah. Desperately Seeking Susan. Uh, when I moved to, to New York in the mid 70s, there was a bankruptcy crisis. There was garbage piled up on the sidewalks. Um, there was a... a there weren't police, you know, they, there were so many government cutbacks that, you know, it felt like outlaw territory in a way. I mean, in one of the interesting, th you know, graffiti all over the place. The great thing about that is that it was sort of a breeding ground for all these artists, many of whom went on to be quite successful, like Keith Haring and uh, Basquiat and, 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 and some of the early punk bands, you know, because no one was paying attention. You could kind of do your thing. You could draw on the walls, you could paint on the sidewalks and you could make films without a permit. Mm -hmm. I did with Smithereens. I didn't even know you needed a permit to film. So we would just show up at a place and start filming. Uh, like the, uh, there's a scene in an abandoned where there's a, a, a graffiti painted van in an abandoned lot under the West Side Highway. We just parked the van there and, you know, there were that stretch of the West Side Highway had a lot of street traffic. It was a lot of 
you know, um, hookers and <laughs> all kinds of colorful characters. Colorful <laughs> yeah. characters. Um, so, so, you know, we'd watch them doing their thing. They'd watch us doing our thing and no one came by to stop us. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so that was very liberating. And again, being kind of naive because I was this suburban girl, <laughs> you know, I grew up feeling safe in the suburbs. You know, I, I kind of honestly did not realize how scary New York was at that time because mm -hmm. it was crime ridden, but uh, ignorance was bliss. So sure. we just, you know, did our thing. Well, and very successfully too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so obviously we'll, we'll talk about a little bit about Desperately Seeking Susan. We don't want to give too much away because the book is really, really great. And obviously yeah. people have seen the movie. Um, uh, so on a personal note, I got to say, having seen Desperately Seeking Susan while living in the suburbs of Philadelphia, yeah. I remember seeing Madonna walking around New York City and I thought, this is such a magical thing. Like, and I was so compelled to want to do the same thing to get to New York. And I, 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 I often say to myself, I'm like, I wonder if I had never seen Desperately Seeking Susan, if I would have ever wanted to go to New York city. Like, I wonder if that was like the driving force behind why I wanted to go because, and you say, you sort of mentioned in the book that you, you paint the canvas of New York in a very, not whimsical way, but it's a bit more glamorous maybe than yeah. it sort of really was. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting because a combination that I like in, in, in films in other people's films and in my own is this combination of gritty and magical. And I think that's what I try to do to some extent. Um, I mean, desperately seeking Susan with all the magical elements, the magic club, the magical lighting has more of that. But but it's there in in smithereens too, in yeah. little ways. I mean, I see the little things I did. Like if you, there, there's a, a shot of Ren walking up a staircase in the tenement building where she lives. She's wearing dark, sort of shiny shoes out of the Wizard of Oz. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> they weren't, you know, punk shoes. They were like <laughs> Dorothy shoes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there's just, um, and, and when I look at movies that I've liked, like, uh, for example, Fellini's uh, Knights of Kiberia, which mm -hmm. was really an inspiration for me. If, if anyone out there hasn't seen it, they should definitely watch yeah. the movie because the character of Julietta Messina, the actress, very much influenced the character of Red, her, Ren, her wardrobe, her attitude. She's kind of... Um, there's a naiveness and a, a kind of determination and a grittiness, but she just keeps going, like the Energizer Bunny or something. You keep, you know, life keeps knocking her down, yet she keeps popping back up and, you know, has this sort of fantasy life that she wants to live out. Mm -hmm. And to me, that element of that fantasy life, but in a gritty surrounding, was that combination appealed to me. Yeah. No, it's well, and I think. I mean, because when I will tell people about, you know, my favorite Madonna movie, I always go to Desperately Seeking Susan. Yeah. And I say, not only is it a great movie that Madonna's in, but I also, because it's a fantastic movie on its own, but then I also say, it's a fantastic time capsule for New York in that time. Like you, yeah. you very much have New York as another character in that film, yeah. which I thought mm -hmm. was is wonderful because that New York doesn't exist anymore. Right. And that Madonna doesn't exist anymore because she was obviously very self-aware, but she was not a powerful, you know, um, recording artist, you know, who could command business the way she, she could after your film. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, when we started out, um, she, you know, she had had, I guess the first album had come out and she had some videos on early MTV. Mm hmm. So I knew her because I had I was living in the in 
um, downtown. So, and I was involved in the music scene, having done smithereens. So I knew her name, but I didn't know her. And then I started to see her. I, it was borderline, I guess. That was mm -hmm. the thing that I first started to pay attention that this person, the camera likes this person. <laughs> Uh -huh. um but she was not famous because if you've ever seen any behind the scenes footage from that movie you'll see she's walking around the street no one yeah. there's no security there's no nothing she's talking to people she's talking to the crew she's walking down the street and and then it changed by the end of the movie because oh, yeah. it, um like a virgin album was was about to come out and she was starting to get all that publicity but but it's interesting. I want to go back to something that you said earlier, which was I one of the really gratifying things that I found is I've gotten many um, letters and emails and over the years of people who said to me, men and women, um, gay and straight and saying, I watched that film and it made me want to be my authentic self and move to New York. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of what I wanted to capture because that story is my story of wanting what it was about New York that made me want to move there. And I, and I, you know, I'm so glad that people, you know, whether it was really that movie or they were just flattering me, I don't know. But, but I think that that vision of New York at that time did inspire people to mm -hmm. want to, yeah, be be themselves in some way and go to a place where they could be themselves. Yeah. Well, and then there's just so many wonderful, I mean, I could, I won't, but I could fawn all day about de the things that are amazing about Desperate Lucy and Susan mm -hmm. between the the costumes and the, just the characters and how fully developed they all are. And mm -hmm. just like, even some of the like, the background characters. I mean, I don't know if you're aware, but like people trip out over the prostitute who's in the bathroom at Port Authority when Madonna's drying her armpits and you can hear the prostitute. He asked me for change, change, <laughs> you know, and like just little yeah. snippets like, or like when the, the band that, that, um, Jim is in and they're all walking into I guess their gig and the the female in the group is like you know like what is this Woodstock you know like yeah. there's so many things <laughs> like yeah. the, the lines Golden. in that movie <laughs> are, are just yeah. amazing yeah. and yeah um, Su Susan so my brother and I um you know we our film history was film education was cable in the 80s so we watched smithereens all the time and desperately seeking susan and to this day whenever we talk we always say it to each other on the phone hola gary and it's <laughs> like yeah. Yeah. no one no one gets that no one understands that but it's we yeah. we we just love that one part when uh she's watching the yeah. gary's oasis commercial in spanish <laughs> it's brilliant. i love i love that too and that actor is wonderful i don't remember yeah. his name maybe you do but he was he was very funny mm -hmm. um, but you know what I tried to do, because I love details, and I think, you know, that expression, God is in the details. You know, there's certain movies I watch that I watch them once, and I've seen it, I've seen the story. Maybe I'll watch them again if I like them enough. But but the, there's no need, because I sort of feel like I it was all there on the surface, and I got yeah. it. And But the movies that I really, really love are those movies where each time you watch them, there's just something different you notice something in the background or something that somebody mm -hmm. was wearing or a sign in the background you know what was playing on the billboard of a movie theater that was yeah. in the background because you know that was put there right. <laughs> that probably you know if it was a movie with any sort of budget they put that billboard up mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? or they chose that location for for that reason um, so, you know, the fact that you can go back and see it and, and notice something new or, you know, it's got those layers is, is really gratifying to me and certainly would be to Ed Lockman and Santo Loquasto because you spend a lot of time, you know, infusing mm -hmm. the, uh, the film with all that stuff and you just hope people notice it or, even if they don't, that is somehow is is there in the back of the viewing experience. Sure. Yeah, I, I worked at Film Society of Lincoln Center for many years uh, in the programming yeah. department, and I got to meet Ed Lockman many times. And he 
kind of got annoyed with me because I would always have to talk to him about Desperately Seeking Susan. <laughs> but um, he, you know, he he said great things about you. And he told me how easy Madonna was to, lit, you know, to do the lighting for. He said, she was like, it's like she doesn't really have any bad angles. And I'm like, he goes, he goes, that's not true about other actors. But uh. <laughs> yeah, she also has great skin. You know, there's certain actresses that you work with. I'll tell you somebody else who had just luminous and just had good skin and lighting you need that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Anne Magnuson had oh, really yes. mm. oh, I good love skin. her. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, Ed taught me so much. He taught me one. He 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 taught me that a frame, a film frame, should only have two main colors. You know, when you watch like a mainstream Disney movie and you analyze it, there's just too many colors going on in the frame. Yeah. So you don't know where to look. Your eye isn't focused in anything. But when you look at like, you know, a frame like um, in front of the Magic Club in mm -hmm. Really Seeking Susan, there's green and there's purple, mm -hmm. you know, primarily, you know, the, yeah. the, 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 the gels he was putting on the, uh, on the outdoor lighting, which, which was also a new thing back then. It, it, the, the idea of putting gels on the lighting or, or very colorful gels on the lighting after it did it, then became, start to become overused because mm -hmm. every MTV video of the yeah. mid eighties to the mid nineties had those colored gels, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but not before then. I mean, Ed really, he was, uh, he painted with light. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about your collaborators on the film. Yeah. Like, for example, the writer Leora Barish, who wrote a really yeah. great script. And um, yeah. I see parallels between Celine and Julie Go Boating. Did you guys um, talk about influences on how to, um, you know, bring to life a story about two women, which, you know, passes the Bechdel test perfectly, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, when I, one of the films that I remembered when I was a film student, I went to the um, New York Film Festival at Lincoln Center. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing Cel Celine and Julie and being blown away. It's a very wacky film and yeah. you have to be very patient because it's about three and a half hours long. But <laughs> the whole idea of these two women that change identities, that swap identities, um, fascinated me. And when I read uh, Leora's, the first draft of Leora's script, and then I got to meet her, I said, did you happen to ever see this movie, Celine and Julie Go Boating? And she said, I love that movie. I was <laughs> by that movie. And, uh, you know, and that, you know, was another reason I wanted, you know, I was so attracted to, to the original script. Mm -hmm. um, the the identity swap, but also that magical feeling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she, in her script, she had the magic club where they go and they, you know, kind of get confused for one another, you know, but but that idea of magic plays a huge part in Celine and Julie. Yeah. And and then also uh, Santo Loquasto, who had made a name for himself working with Woody Allen and other New York based directors. And, um, you know, don't give anything away, but there are some really great stories in the book about how he came up with different things for Madonna's outfits. But tell us about what it was like working with him and discovering his talent at um, outfitting everyone. Yeah, no, he was great. And I, I mean, really, I, I feel so privileged to have worked with Santo and Ed Lockman and mm -hmm. to realize that we all had the same kind of vision for this film. And, and one of the things about Santo, and I might be wrong about this, but I think before Desperately Seeking Susan, he had just been a costume designer on Woody Allen's movie. Mm -hmm. He did one Sidney Lum Lumet movie before Desperately Seeking Susan, but it, I don't remember which one it was. Uh -huh. uh, oh, it was one with Lauren Bacall, um, where she's stalked by, she's an actor. Oh, the, the fan, yeah, that's right. Think, oh, that that's might, right. He might've done that. I might be wrong, I might be confused, but I think so. But this was the first time that he was both the costume designer as well as the production designer. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about that was that he had this 
vision of what was going to be on the frame. He knew what the person was going to be wearing when they sat on that green couch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so it wasn't, you know, I've seen movies where I feel like the costumes and the production design are a little bit competing with each other. Mm -hmm. But it was wonderful to have somebody who could just sort of pull all that together. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, so, so I think a lot of, it was after Desperately Seeking Susan that he did those Woody Allen movies that are now those just great late yeah. 80s, early 90s, uh, you know, Woody Allen films. Um, but the other good thing about it, because uh, I, I'm not sure that the studio was thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a, a unified vision for the costumes and the word uh, and the production design. They were thinking budget. And so <laughs> they were able <laughs> to get these two key roles, um, you know, pay one person maybe mm -hmm. a little more than they would have paid each individual. Mm -hmm. But it was a, a budgetary uh, issue as well that that turned out to be a creative benefit. Yeah, yeah, after reading your book, I you know went back and watched some of your films. But I, I, I this time I really focused on the costumes and you know the cinematography and locations and all that. But I, I noticed this time, which because I'm always looking at Madonna, but this time I loved the evolution of Roberta's character from Fort Lee to the very last scene. I, I love how it's very subtle changes. Uh, you know, she dresses as Susan, but then she has her own style towards the end. And it's it's very yeah. it's very uh, specific. Yeah. I, I love that. It, it was charted out. I mean, you know, we knew the progression that that character needed to 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 take. Um, um, the, the other thing was it, it was it was very, you know, in the conversations with Ed and Santo right from the beginning, we knew we wanted to create two very distinct worlds. So, you know, it was no accident that when we first meet Roberta in the hair salon, you know, everything is sort of pink and peach. Uh -huh. Then we see her at her party and everything is muted beige and, you know, these kind of very um, soothing but neutral kind mm -hmm. of colors. And Susan's world is, it, it hits you right from the start. We see her, we first introduce her in that rather garish Atlantic City hotel mm -hmm room you know and uh you know in her black outfit with the pyramid jacket i mean everything is the way you introduce a character was very yeah. important you know to to make that difference very clear right from the start yeah, yeah. well i mean you knocked it out of the park like there's so, so many iconic things about that movie and i just realized we didn't even ask this question but like Props to you for putting together such a kick-ass soundtrack for that movie. Like, I wish that there was like soundtracks that like, cause movies didn't really do soundtracks at that time where, but like yeah. all of the music in that movie is amazing music. Not like barring the fact that you used Madonna's demo of Into the Groove, which to me is the far superior version of Into the Groove. You had but respect. Like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> like there were so many great songs. Even the song that opens the title, it's Urgent by, mm -hmm. but not the Foreigner version. It's uh, like an alternate version. And I love that song. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And speaking of music, though, I also had the privilege of working with Tom Newman mm -hmm. In the very early stage of his uh, career, and it was, um, you know, he had done some teen comedies, be one or two, I think. I, one in particular that I was not a fan of. Um, and so when they first, the production super, a music supervisor said, you know, Tom Newman whatever, you know, I wasn't super excited. I didn't know his work. I didn't know how brilliant he would be as his career progressed, but um, it was wonderful sitting with him in his studio and hearing him sort of tinker with what became to me a very signature sound, that kind of tinkly sound that mm -hmm. has mystery and magic in it. It's the sound of when Madonna gets off the bus 
Love in that. Port Authority, whatever that mm -hmm. sound is, that I have then heard in some of his, for me, and maybe no one else will feel this way, but when I hear the opening shot, that amazing shot in The Player, Robert Altman's The Player, yeah. if you listen to Tom Newman's soundtrack, it's there in that opening sequence of The Player. I also hear it in American Beauty. When I yeah. listen to the American mm -hmm. Beauty soundtrack, I I can trace that sound back to uh, Desperately Seeking Susan. Sure. I mean, it goes in other directions, and but uh, I remember when he was playing that or playing around on his keyboard, you know, before, you know, just watching the evolution of that. Mm -hmm was fascinating. Now, I love that you worked with him again in Cookie because it's very, very uh, similar in Cookie as well. And um, also I heard it in Less Than Zero, which I watched recently. I was like, is that the same composer? And sure enough, it was. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's move on. I know we, we seriously, we, we could talk about that because as you can see, in all days. I'm sure you've <laughs> talked, you've talked your ear off about it enough in, in your lifetime. But yeah, let's talk about some of the other films that you've worked on. Obviously, there was Making Mr. Right, there was She Devil, there was Cookie. Um, you you have a really great way of creating a universe, a world around the films that you that you do. How do you go about creating those landscapes? I mean, everything comes out of the character. You know, you try to figure out who the character is. And then from there, you say, what would she wear or he wear? What would their, what kind of car would they drive? What would their house look like? You know, but it, it all starts with the character. And I love characters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, <clears throat> one of the things that, I know I do, and because I, I love old movies and I love movie genres, but I love twisting them, is to be able to infuse characters in a kind of structure, whether it's a screwball comedy structure or a mafia comedy structure or a revenge comedy structure, but using that, um, what should I say, skeleton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> using those bones yeah. to hang all the things that I like on them. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I, I have to talk about Cookie because it's one of my favorite movies. I saw it in the theater when it came out. And um, I was at the time really impressed with Emily Lloyd from seeing her in Wish You Were Here. And it was it was kind of like she just shot out of a cannon and suddenly everybody in Hollywood wanted to work with her. Um, so I, I love everything that you talk about in the book uh, about the making the film. How was she brought to your attention? And um, and then after that, you can tell us what it was. What was different about shooting Cookie in New York after your experience with Susan? Because it was the same landscape, but now you had more money and you had uh, more resources, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I like uh, you saw Wish You Were Here, and I thought, wow, I love the freshness of that character yeah. I love her spirit i love her rebellious rebelliousness that was also kind of adorable mm -hmm. <laughs> for yeah. lack of a better word you know that there was this sweet um feistiness there cheekiness i guess i would mm -hmm. use that word um that i liked and and i remember talking with the casting um director ellen chenoweth saying oh couldn't let, let's see if we can find an american Emily Lloyd, um, and we auditioned a lot of people, some of whom would have been great in their own. So I don't want to give anything away, but yeah, don't. Because there's people, there's some good ones in there. There's <laughs> people who would have been very good. It would have been a different interpretation of that character. But we also held an open audition for just anyone. I I don't remember where we posted the the audition. Whether it was in you know backstage or one of those actor newspapers or mm -hmm. whatever. And there were hundreds, there was like a line, you know, of, of um, aspiring actresses, you know, without agents, um, you know, auditioning. And we found there was one young actress that I really liked. I remember her name was Teresa. She was the real deal. Mm -hmm. She was almost, she was like, 
second choice or third choice maybe. And then I think, um, I don't know if it was the studio or the, the powers that be were just a little nervous about going with a, a total unknown. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, you know, so after looking for the American um, uh, Emily Lloyd, we said, well, why don't I meet the real one? Maybe she could, <laughs> she could pull it off. And I just liked her and, yeah. uh, you know, Ellen liked her and Peter Falk liked her. Uh, that was important. Yeah. And so we sent her to live with the Brooklyn family for a couple <laughs> of weeks, <laughs> um, hoping that some of that authenticity would, uh, you know, rub off. And we also gave her an acting, I mean, a voice uh, coach, a guy named Tim Monick, who's probably the best known voice guy mm -hmm. in America. I mean, he's he's on every movie um, now. He was starting out back then. But, uh, you know, so he was on set every, you know, listening through earphones every day. Yeah, her dialect was amazing. Like you would never yeah. have known. I hear the British at times. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes but, feel that way with Kate Winslet. Like when Kate Winslet did Mayor of Easttown, because that's Delco, I was like, yeah, she sort of gets it, but I can still, yeah. she's not quite, same yeah. thing with Toni Collette in Sixth Sense, where she's supposed to be doing a Philly accent. Yeah. I'm like, it's yeah. not just, yeah. like, she doesn't say water or yeah. or yeah. phone, you know, like, there's, yeah. she just doesn't nail that just as much. I think it's because British dialect is so proper that they would never say water. You know, like, oh, can I have, I have a glass of water? They would never say that. <laughs> water. Water. Yeah, I say water. I don't hear your Philly accent, though. I Because I, when I went to Long Island for college, people would mock me saying, Wooder? What are you saying Wooder for? And so I would start teasing the Long Island accent. And I think mm -hmm. something about the teasing the Long Island accent and trying to correct it, my yeah. Philly accent just leveled out. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not upset by that. No. <laughs> you still have bits of it. So um, bit here, there. I... I, I Yes. Other people tell me, oh, I, I thought you were from Philly. Sometimes they say, I thought you're from New York, but it, New York and Philly accents are mm -hmm. totally different. Totally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so just so you know, Susan, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but uh, Emily Lloyd wrote a memoir that was released in the UK about five years ago, and she has some incredible things to say about you, um, you know, at we don't have to talk about this at length, but, you know, she kind of left Hollywood and, uh, you know, had to deal with some mental health issues as most people do, but uh, she's come out the other side and, um, you know, she wrote this very, very uh, informative book about what it's like to be a stranger in Hollywood. And um, yeah, it's worth a read. Yeah, I I actually, I, I know of the book and I've read bits of it and mm -hmm. she was lovely, but it was, and I don't want to give anything from yeah. my book away. No, but don't. <laughs> it, it, it was, uh, you know, she was 16 and she was living alone with lots of, uh, you know, New York is a is a tempting city. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and I hope she would be okay. And yeah. I'm glad to hear, I hope now she is. I know she went through a hard period. Yeah. So one last thing about Cookie is that the character actors are incredible. I mean, you were ahead of the curve because this was a movie about the mob in New York City before Goodfellas, before The Sopranos. Um, but it's it's very singular. It doesn't it doesn't feel like any other film I've seen. I loved the work you got out of Brenda Vaccaro, Michael Vigazzo, uh, Peter yeah. Falk, and Jerry yeah. Lewis. I mean, what was it was it intimidating, or were you just right there with them saying, "Look, okay, hit your mark," and you know. <laughs> It's a little intimidating meeting Jerry Lewis for the first time because, you know, I grew up watching him on that uh, the the telethon, the yeah. uh, the multiple dystrophy uh, telephone. That was the end of the summer. That was Labor Day weekend. Yeah. <laughs> um, and of course, I knew his films um, from the fifties, the Bell sure. Bellboy, and mm -hmm. all those. Um, Again, I have a funny story about when I first met him, and I don't want to 
right years um read the but, book it's very entertaining yeah <laughs> but, but i was a little you know like this is really jerry lewis and he's very big mm -hmm. he's a big man and he's not that little skinny guy from you know um the bellhop he's yeah he's the big guy and i'm a little woman <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was you know just getting used to to that was was very uh interesting but he was but he was a sweetie pie I mean he was mm -hmm. very nice to me and um in fact uh during the making of that film I pulled my back out one day uh this is a story I did not put in the book I started to and then took it exclusive <laughs> um, i i pulled my back out one day we were staying in a hotel in atlantic city and there was a, a telephone on the other side of the the bed from I, I was sleeping on one side of the bed my part my partner of 37 years was sleeping on the other side and the phone rang and i reached over him to grab the phone and i twisted something so the next and the next thing i knew is i could not get out of bed we were saying at claridge's the claridge's oh. and a ambulance i could i literally could not move an ambulance had to come to the hotel. And the next thing I know, there's the entire crew is gathered in the lobby to be driven in vans to the location. And I am being wheeled out on a gurney um, because I can't move and taken to the hospital. Um, so that day uh, in the hospital, they kind of shot me up with Valium in the muscle to, <laughs> to relax me. Um, uh, and and the the crew did some second unit car driving shots or whatever, and Jerry Lewis with I, I sh was in the hospital. I think I stayed over one night. The f within an hour, I got a huge bouquet of flowers oh. from from Jerry Lewis. He had that old Hollywood, that old school yeah. kind of courteous knew what things to do yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's um, sweet. and that uh that was very interesting it was also interesting to work with somebody who came from that old hollywood yeah. school sure now just a little sidebar i love seeing joy behar in her small role as a yeah. diane weiss employee um i was like oh my god it's joy behar and she's hilarious <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and she was good she was great mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's funny because part of the inspiration, one of the reasons I wanted to make that movie was not just because I liked the characters. It was also because I my, I, I had a, a tough relationship with my father. My father was a little bit of a tough guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he, he was a pussycat inside, but on the outside, he, you know, he was a tough guy. Um, uh, and I was a rebellious teenager, and and even before, I was a rebellious kid, <laughs> an early yeah. age. And that scene where Peter Falk chases Emily around the dining room table, uh -huh. so that he's, I don't know if he takes off his belt and threatens to well, She's like, him. what are you going to do, tough guy? <laughs> gonna, that's a scene out of my childhood. Oh, wow. You know, I love that. Um, the, uh, uh, th a scary but 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 playful version of mm -hmm. that. But I can remember me and my sister being chased around the the in a you know my father threatening to to give us a strap licking. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Didn't but threatened. <laughs> you know? We um, my, we were the wooden spoon. That's oh we really. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember being afraid of the wooden spoon. So. <laughs> But, but you were talking about those guys. I mean, New York has all these great um, Italian American actors or ethnic actors that mm -hmm. are such great characters and wonderful actors, and we're so much fun to work with. And um, it's funny. I did a movie, uh, a, maybe about a decade later when I was filming in Canada, it was called a cooler climate. It was with Judy Davis. and Oh Sally yes. Where Sally Field becomes the maid. I like yeah, that. Sally Field. Yeah. Yes. She gets divorced. She has no skills except for being a house, a homemaker and she gets a job as a maid. 
And we needed an ethnic person for, I forget which role it was. So we were saying, aren't there, there there's gotta be some, I think it was a Jewish lawyer. It was scripted as a Jewish lawyer. There's gotta be some Jews in Vancouver. There's gotta be some <laughs> Jews. Okay, no, just Italian actors. <laughs> Let's go, with you know, somebody that, <laughs> that has an ethnic something. <laughs> and it was very hard to find in, in Vancouver. Yeah, but, but New York has a great supply of all kinds of actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and speaking of New York, so you directed the first four episodes of Sex in the City, a show with, which drastically altered conversations and topics that would be featured across television shows for years and years and years, even to today. How do you feel the landscape of television has changed since you worked on Sex in the City? I mean, Sex in the City is back now. Like, it, it's so interesting. Like, and just like that, you yeah. you know, you you worked on it and now it's, it's here it yeah. is again. Well, what was great about especially because it was a different experience. I liked all of it, but what I liked most was doing the pilot because you got to be involved in creating the template. You know, there wasn't mm -hmm. the sex in the city, sex in the city. So you were involved in, in creating the feel of the show. Um, I've done other episodic TV back in the nineties. And I got to be honest, I didn't always love it sometimes i thought of it as a directing exercise or as a job because basically the you know this is what the show looks like right here's the script can you copy this feeling um so being involved at the start of something was 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 a lot of fun but i have to say that today you know especially it started before the pandemic but i really noticed it during the pandemic because i got to watch a lot of TV. I mean, TV's gotten really good. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. much of it is, it, it was not that bold. HBO and then Showtime followed with a lot, you know, some bold programming in the really the late 90s into the 2000s, but there wasn't that much that was great. Uh, and now, you know, watching, especially a lot of these limited series, yeah. you know, it's better than a lot of movies. So, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and the other thing I noticed is that there's a lot more women directing them, which is really nice to see a lot more opportunity for women. Uh, yeah. And, and the budgets are amazing in, on some of these series. So they're not just doing little domestic comedies they're they're yeah. doing some big challenging stuff yeah yeah i i had the fortune of uh doing background work but right before i left new york i did background work for and just like that the sex in the city reboot and yeah. i was amazed at the money that was being spent to do that like that i mean it was like a i felt like i was on a movie set because yeah. the production value was so high and so grand and yeah. Yeah. I, I was I was gobsmacked. Like I had no idea. Like the, the amount of time that went into filming something that when I finally saw it on TV, I was like, that's it. That's like we spent eight <laughs> hours doing that and that's all it is. It's one, it's yeah. not even 30 seconds. You know, it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Which episode were you in the background of? I actually, you actually can see me. I I in the very first episode of And Just Like That, when the women are going to that restaurant and then they speak to Bitsy Von Muffling when Bitsy <laughs> Von Muffling leaves and they all turn around and wave goodbye to her. I walk right behind all of them in this brilliant purple shirt. And I was like, Oh, that's my claim to fame. I was on sex in the city. There we go. <laughs> I'll have to rewatch. <laughs> I was happy. I, there's another moment where I'm in the background of some like Sarah Jessica uh, yeah. uh, walks right by me and I'm laughing at some party scene or whatever, but yeah. it, it, it's really interesting. This is something I, I, I talk about in the book and I can kind of say it. Um, you know, when I was uh, starting out and especially when I was a film student, um, I mean, no one talked about TV shows or tv actors tv yeah. actors made a lot of money if you were in a hit tv show you made a shitload of money but you didn't have the clout right of a of a movie star and um suddenly 
you know, today, everything, you know, I watch the, you know, the Oscars and half the presenters are TV stars. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, it was interesting because I first started noticing that change. I, I've taught off and on at NYU Film School over the years, and it might have been sometime in around 2000. 15 or 16, I was teaching, I teach a directing uh, seminar. I started notice that, noticing that my students were talking about TV shows as much as they were talking about um, movies. And, um, you know, a TV show like Girls, Lena right. Dunham was like a hero for a lot of them, mm-hmm. like an auteur, you know, and they would talk about her work and the show in ways that I remember talking about, you know, European actresses. <laughs> and so it, 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 you know, it started shifting around that time. Uh, of course, there were exceptions, Sex in the City, Sopranos. Right. Oz, perhaps, um, but really a little before the pandemic and then during the pandemic, all anyone talked about was, you know, <laughs> series and yeah, right whatever you could so. binge on Netflix. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, Susan, besides your new book, are there any upcoming projects you want to talk about or plug or is it just you're focused on the book right now? I- I'm focused on the book, but one thing that it's, it's so weird. Cause I am like a one trick pony, I guess. But, um, I, uh, when, even when I was making a movie, I would talk sometimes to friends of mine and they would say, Oh, I'm about to do this, but I have this coming up and I'm rewriting that script. And then there's the other one. I, I can't, I, I focus on one thing. I'm like micro focused. So when I was doing any of the movies I did, that is all I focused on. Maybe I kind of thought a little bit about something, you know, if I read a good Mm. script, but yeah, I, I, I I can only do one thing at a time. Can't pat my head and rub my tummy. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, I I think the, the the attention to detail definitely comes through in your work. Yeah, I think yeah. between your movies and then the the stories that you tell in the book. Like I was reading your your book and thought, God, I can't even remember what I was doing when I was in high school. To this, like you so are so articulate yeah. with details. I was like, wow, she's got you've got a great memory. Well, it's funny because sometimes it's those little details that stand stand out, and you know that. You know, I sometimes I would micro focus. There's some details about the making of, of Desperately Seeking Susan, which I'm not going to mention, mm-hmm. that I remember, and probably no one else remembers them, but yeah. I've been obsessing about that thing for, you know, 38 years or something. Yeah, no, and, and to the, our listeners, I mean, another thing that is so engaging is your journey from wrapping smithereens to going to con. I mean, it's so auspicious how everything just kind of comes into play and that's a great part of the book so I have to mention that well it's a little bit fits into my narrative my personal narrative which Mm -hmm. is this Alice in Wonderland thing you know this this desire to kind of enter this other world and be amazed by what I was seeing and I truly you know when I showed up at the Cannes Film Festival in the official selection representing the United States, along with um, the film Missing by Costa Gavras and <laughs> Moon by Alan Parker yeah. and Smithereens, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a little like, what, what is this world and what are we doing here? And this is kind of jaw-droppingly amazing. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. And being able to step outside myself a little bit and watch me, that young woman from Huntingdon Valley standing there at the top of those, you know, the red carpet and thinking, oh God, you know, what what's going on? And and kind of a enjoying it a little being nervous as hell, yeah. but enjoying it as a as a narrative outside of myself. (laughs) Yeah. No, that's what I I love about the way you wrote the book, because there's a lot of moments in between um, events in your life where you're like, how did I get here? You know, (laughs) and it's very relatable. I love it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Susan, before we let you go, 
there's a little segment we like to call the lightning round. These are answers that are Madonna focused. They're meant okay. to be quick off the top of your head, wherever you're at in your quote unquote Madonna journey. Don't, okay. don't, don't think too hard. Favorite Madonna song. Like a prayer. Favorite Madonna album. Um, ooh. Um, see, I'm an early Madonna. That's yeah, fine. That's yeah. So are we. <laughs> like a virgin. <laughs> uh, like a virgin. Good funny. Uh, favorite Madonna music video. Oh, see, I, I like watching directors. So I would say Vogue. I think that was David Fincher. Yeah. But I'm also a fan of Mary Lambert. Yeah. So I would say, I guess it's also like a virgin. Oh, the, the Material Girl. I like yeah. that. Material Girl and like a virgin on the gondola. So yeah. you know. uh, I don't know if you've seen any of her tours. Do you have, have do you have a favorite Madonna tour? Um. What was the, it's the, I think it was her, the, it's the one that's in Truth or Dare. Blonde Ambition. Yeah. Blonde Ambition, yes. yes. And that is also, if you're going to ask me my favorite Madonna movie. Well, it, you know, of course I'm yeah. going to. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it probably was Truth or Dare. I, I love that movie. I think it's, it's a great uh, it's it's an authentic performance and it's really interesting because it takes you into her world in a very yeah. interesting way. And I also really liked her in the League of Their Own. Yeah. A League of yeah. Her Own, sorry. Yeah, yeah. A League of, uh, a League of uh, do you have a favorite Madonna look? Yeah, the one in Desperately Seeking Susan, of course. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> That's this one. That one. Yeah. The, the one on the t-shirt that I'm currently wearing. Yeah. yeah. I had that uh, poster on my wall throughout my uh, teenage years. So it's like yeah. every day I would wake up, I'd see your name on my wall. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Susan, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us today. This has been really, really fantastic. Yeah. Tell, tell everyone where they can get your book. Um, well, it's available at all booksellers. You can certainly get it at, at, on Amazon, but June 18th. Uh, I think it'll be at all Barnes and Noble. All the major booksellers will mm -hmm. will have it. Um, so go online, just Google "desperately seeking something." Yeah. Are you, are, will you be doing a book tour? I I am right now. It's it's um, East Coast li m around New York. Okay. I they're gonna send me out right. or not but we're gonna keep an eye out for that because you might see stefan and i in person at your book signing so keep an eye out okay <laughs> i would love to meet you guys in person and i'm still blown away that you're from i was gonna say you have to do a huntington valley book signing or something <laughs> well i'll tell you what there is and i don't know whether there's a there's a um i am doing a a, a book signing screening of Smithereens at the Doylestown uh, Theater. I don't know if you know the Doylestown. It's called the County Theater. Oh, okay. Do it there. And there's also another movie theater that I used to go to when I was a kid called The Highway. Oh. I don't know if that might be before your time. It's where I saw A Hard Day's Night when I was like a 10 or 11. Wow. And it's now a kind of art theater. So I might be, I'm really oh, nice. excited to go back to Abington to do something. Yeah. There's some, I love, yeah. It's fun to stroll back through memory lane and mm -hmm. it's, it is, it's like you going back in time almost. Yeah. yeah. No, talk, talk about full circle, Susan, you watched hard days night, you know, and kind of got lost in that film and then all those years later you have one of the biggest pop stars in the world in your film that you directed so congratulations oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. anyway i gotta go um yeah. so it was great talking with you and thank you for this opportunity thank, thank you, you so much susan we appreciate